All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully more residents will join us in, a, in the next few minutes. Okay, so case number one, uh, this is a 28 year old female. Uh, about two years ago, she started noticing left upper extremity pain and numbness and paresthesia is occurring intermittently that travels down her left thumb. She denies any neck pain. And um, today uh, she uh, notes that while she's sleeping on her side um, or there's any pre pressure applied to her left arm or shoulder, the, her symptoms get, get worse. Um, she's been on gabapentin 300 milligrams three times a day since April, which doesn't really help decrease the pain level. And on her pain diagram, she notes stabbing pain, in the left scapula, the left shoulder, as well as numbness and pins and needles in the left arm and left thumb, excuse me. Past medical history is only significant for anxiety. On physical exam, the uh, only thing notable was some, uh, uh Weakness in her hand intrinsics. Otherwise, she's full strength throughout. No signs of myelopathy, um, and otherwise is intact. Um, so, <clears throat> Victor Liu, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. So, um, so just to recap, we have a 20 year old female with left upper extremity pain and numbness and paresthesias going down uh, into her left thumb, uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, she notes um, on physical exam, it's noted that she has some three, three plus out of five bilaterally hand intrinsic weakness. Um, what, uh, what imaging uh, would be helpful? Um, at this point, I think most helpful would be an MRI, but um, you could also consider CT as well, you know, proofing structural. Okay, great, great, yeah. So uh, of what location? Um, given that location, uh, so cervical and maybe the upper thoracic. Okay, excellent. So like, we're first gonna start off with uh, an x-ray, um, <clears throat> something that we, we often you know, overlook or don't order. So um, what do you see on this AP x-ray that's uh, notable? The x-ray has no, no alignment issues, no obvious compression. Yeah, uh, can you see my mouse? I can, uh-huh. Okay, what do you what do you see here? It's like a hyper. And look for so look for symmetry. Whenever you're looking at any images, is, it, is, it, are, is each side symmetrical? There's like a hyperlucency on the left. Right, right, right. Exactly. Um, so we see a hyper a like an area of lucency. Um, this is around the C five six foramen um, that is clearly visible when comparing it to the contralateral side. So always look for symmetry when looking at any imaging. And if both sides are symmetrical or not, that's 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 one way to kind of uh, take an approach when 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 looking at the an APS cervical X-ray. In addition, you know, obviously looking at the spinous processes, the pedicles, um, etc. Uh, <clears throat> so next, we ordered a, an MRI, like you had suggested. So uh, what can you tell me that you see on the uh, on the MRI, and what sequence is this, just for the interns? Yeah, T2, T2 axial and sagittal. Good, good. And what do you see on the axial and sagittal MRI? Um, at this level, I assume it's the 5-6 level. And, um, there seems to be a, a mass. Um, How would you describe it? Well, circumscribed lesion um, uh, abutting, the, uh, abutting the spinal cord. Um, I'm trying to look to her extension through the foramen. Right. So this is the foramen, right? Yeah. So it's, it's what we'd say hyper intense, yeah. extending out to the C56 foramen, you know, you know, abutting the cord, correct? So um, this is it. These are a few other sequences. So um, tell me what you see here and uh, what kind of sequence you think these two images are. Well, you see this well circumscribed lesion hyper intense. It, it's um, it seems to be coming out of the frame. So this is this is this is contrast enhancing, right? Mm -hmm. Contrast enhancing well circumscribed lesion outside the left. It, it's left sided, um, most likely involving the nerve as it exits the spinal cord and the canal. Right. Okay. So it's extending as you see it's setting out the uh, out through the foramen. Uh, you can sit. You can say that it's you know above the clavicle. It's hyper intense. Um, it, it seems to be extending out into the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. Okay. Um, 
moving forward. Uh, so we kind of described those uh, first initial images. Um, these are just a few bullet points. We talked about that. So now differential diagnosis. Uh, for for a, lesion, a lesion like this, your differentials include schwannoma, uh, also neurofibroma. You could also have malignant uh, tumors, malignant proof. Uh, maybe at that point, maybe not so much uh, so proximal. Right, like a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so good neurofibroma, schwannoma, uh, a malignant tumor, like a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, fibrosarcoma. Um, and one thing I failed to mention because I don't want to give it away is this, this patient it has a syndromic phenomenon uh, going on in terms of her past medical history. But uh, which will, you know, le lean you towards one of these specifically. Um, so just in terms of relevant anatomy. Uh, so yeah, good with the uh, differential. So here, you know, this is coming out of the C56 uh, foramen. So it's, uh, this is formed from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. And then um, this is just a diagram showing the relationship of the uh, upper trunk to the anterior, anterior scalene muscle and the phrenic nerve. Um, and then uh, we see these three trunks emerging from the interscaling space um, as they transverse the inferior region of the posterior triangle of the neck, which we see here. So we see the upper trunk is formed by C5-6, middle trunk C7, C8-T1 forming the lower trunk. And then here we see the, its relationship to the anterior scalene muscle, which will be uh, relevant uh, for the surgical approach. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the the steps involved in the surgery. So um, let's just uh, quickly touch base. What are the goals of surgery, operative pro approach, and what other equipment would you have in the OR, Victor? Um, goals of surgery, I, I guess in this case, earlier we could consider gross total resection. Mm -hmm. And what approach would you take? Uh, I don't know. The, uh, I'm not sure the technical description, but it seemed like what you were describing before, come anterior, um, superior to the clavicle. Um, okay, right. Okay, good. Uh, so a supraclavicular approach and what other equipment would you have in the OR if you're uh, dealing with... You have monitoring um, and uh, you could almost perhaps consider um, ultrasound as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, you, you know, obviously you want to weigh the, your options, but yeah, supraclavicular approach is definitely an uh, approach you would use in this case, uh, you could use in this case, I, I should say. Um, and uh, you would always also want intraoperative nerve stimulation um, as you're dealing with the upper trunk, phrenic nerve, and other important critical structures to help navigate um, yourself as you're going through that corridor. Um, so yeah, like you said, you make a small trainer's decision about two centimeters above the clavicle from the midline, and then um, you're essentially dissecting along the anatomical plane between the carotid artery and sheath and the trachea and esophagus medially. And then as you, uh, this is just a, a diagram showing kind of your, your, the, your final approach. You see like the anterior scalene muscle. Oftentimes you have to reflect that anterior and scalene muscle superolaterally, as well as the supraclavicular uh, fat pad in order to see um, the upper trunk. Um, so that was, that's what was done in this case. So next we'll go through uh, pathology, Dr. Giltikin, if you're available. Yeah, I was just going to mention a yeah. couple of Great. Oh yes, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Oh, yeah. Great, great job uh, describing. I mean, the I think the first thing is you know surgery, no surgery. I mean, definitely the threshold for surgery in you know, someone with NF and multiple lesions is if they are symptomatic. We felt like she was symptomatic, or her pain was on the left side and in the appropriate distribution. Uh, unfortunately, like this is a case where it, it would be impossible to resect the tumor from any one approach. Uh, just because it's posterior involving the cord and interspinal contents and it's anterior. If you look at the axial images, I don't see there's a good axial image, but if you go a little lower, it goes way out into the anterior scalene uh, muscle. Uh, so it, it's really something that would need two approaches if you wanted a complete resection. And, uh, you know, someone with this lesion and NF, 
99% of the time it's going to be neurofibroma and not schwannoma. We'll see if the pathology actually supports that. But many times it's a plexiform neurofibroma. And this, this definitely looked like that at surgery, which makes it more complicated to resect because there's often functional nerve roots entangled within the neurofibroma. So we decided to do uh, anterior to start with just to see how much we could remove because that was where she was symptomatic from. She didn't really have any myelopathy. Uh, and um, yeah, we did, a, I would say, a partial resection of the anterior part of the tumor because when we did went intraoperatively, everything that was around the tumor, including uh, fascicles that looked involved with the tumor were functional and she had no neurological deficit to start with. So you don't want to go in there and create a neurological deficit when you're resecting the tumor. So intraoperative nerve stimulation is super important. Uh, about three, four months ago, we were called into the OR for a very similar case that ENT was doing, and they did not use nerve stimulation, and, and the upper trunk was gone after the resection of the tumor, and obviously the patient woke up with severe deficit. So intraoperative nerve stimulation is super important. It'll guide your extent of resection. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy. And this, and then for this patient, this is something you would, the residual tumor is something you would watch on sequential uh, MRIs in the future. I think she's going to need a post here at some point. And, you know, we would probably be aggressive and take off the facet completely resect as much possible as laterally, laterally, but when she becomes a myelopathic, we'll just hold off for now. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, now we'll go to the uh, pathology section. Dr. Goltekin, if you're available. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. No, uh, um, I have really serious uh, connection problems this morning. So anyway, um, yeah, from the specimen we received, it was obvious that this was probably a partial resection. And uh, there were fragments of tissue which showed on the left side some uh, peripheral nerve uh, histology. And on the right side, it's more complicated, uh, irregular histology with um, some uh, mixtoid degeneration in the background and scattered, uh, you know, cells uh, with spindle cell morphology. But very uh, low cellularity here. Next one. I just wanted to show the nerves here. There's a lot of uh, degenerated nerve intermixed with the tumor. Next. Okay. Yeah, here also you see on the right upper corner some, some uh, peripheral nerve uh, fascicle. And then you see here clearly a moderately cellular area on the left, which is, again, more spindle cell uh, and no mitosis, no malignant attributes and it really doesn't look like a schwannoma uh, at all uh, next yeah here is what i'm talking about with the mixoid degeneration collagen fibers and spindle cell tumors with no no significant atypia or uh, nuclear enlargement so we call this uh a uh, neurofibroma. The plexiform business has more to do with how the tumor infiltrates into multiple uh, nerves, and it's more detectable, uh, I guess, intraoperatively and radiologically, depending on the specimen. We can say that too. In this specimen, I couldn't. I just said neurofibroma, and uh, you know, you you could see how uh, entangled it was with. Uh, normal peripheral nerve, which is never the case in schwannomas. And right. there is no malignant element in this particular specimen. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Goldtekin. So uh, try to nail this image in your head for, uh, for your boards in terms of uh, neurofibroma and um, pathology slides that come up. Um, this is these types of images, this one and this one right here, uh, very quintessential for neurofibroma when they, when they're, uh, testing you. And then uh, in terms of like schwannoma, you know, important buzzwords to remember for schwannoma, you know, kind of antony A, antony B uh, cells, et cetera. So just uh, try to learn all those buzzwords for, for uh, next March. 
Uh, in terms of, you know, brachial plexus nerve fibromas, you know, Dr. Vatikin already went over a lot of this. Um, something, you know, important to remember, unlike schwannomas, which tend to displace the surrounding neural structures, neurofibromas and nerve fascicles are intim uh, intimately involved in the tumor. And there's a tendency for the neurofibroma to arise from a motor portion of the nerve, whereas most schwannomas uh, arise from the sensory portion of the nerve. Um, in terms of the term plexiform, you know, Dr. Gulti can already mention this comes from the, the infiltrative growth pattern. That histology looks like a plexus or a network. And these plexiform neurofibromas, as Dr. Levy mentioned, is commonly found in patients with NF1. And, you know, they're often composed of the same types of uh, cell types as cutaneous neurofibromas, but they also have an expanded extracellular matrix. You know, while these, these uh, tumors are generally benign, there is a potential for a malignant transformation, which can occur in five to 10% of the larger tumors. So I, you know, if complete resection is possible, that's obviously preferred. Um, just due to the infiltrating nature of these tumors, though, the resection is, complete resection is usually not possible. Um, and then uh, this is just an interesting uh, article published by uh, the M neurosurgery department, the NIH. They were looking at ways to uh, able to discern a, you know, a neurofibroma from a typical neurofibroma um, on imaging. And they found that uh, those tumors that had uh, elevated uptake of uh, fluor uh, fluorodeoxyglucose 18, um, seen here, uh, was uh, elevated in atypical uh, neurofibromas and atypical uh, neurofibromatose neoplasms of uncertain uh, biological significance. Uh, but um, you can see the, the difference, the jump um, in terms of the, the fluorodeoxyglucose uptake between a, a typical, a, a classic neurofibroma versus uh, an atypical. So next, uh, we'll go to case two. Um, let's see, who do we have with us? Uh, <clears throat> we can ask you there. Vignesh, I am, I am, I am, Ignacio. Vignesh, Vignesh, are you there, Vignesh? Okay. Uh, Eva, are you there? Eva, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is a 33-year-old gentleman with a history of chronic migraines. Uh, he was seen uh, for worsening headaches by a, a new neurologist. And during his exam, he was found to have left-sided nystagmus. He then was referred to our clinic. We saw him via telemedicine. So, you know, a full physical exam wasn't really uh, uh, documented because of uh, the telehealth uh, nature of the visit. But essentially he's 33 years old, um, chronic migraines, left side nystagmus, has a history of uh, chronic migraine and um, asthma. Uh, this was, this is, again, the horizontal nystagmus is all that was noted. So, um, Let's just go straight to imaging. So, you know, obviously he had a, an MRI done. Um, what do you see on his MRI? And just kind of, you know, tell me what, what this sequence here is in the middle, the one on the right and the one on the far left. And just tell me what you see just for the, and tell me what imaging study it is just for the, uh, you know, the interns. Uh, yeah, so it looks like on the left, it's a, um, contrasted scan and then on the middle it's t2 or sorry on the left it's t1 on the middle it's a t2 on the right it's a contrasted yep. scan and so, then uh, uh, so it was a little tricky t2, it's t2 flare on the left t2 in the middle t1 on the right but continue you're doing great oh i see uh and then um it looks like there's a non-contrast enhancing lesion that's uh in the cp angle um extending down like next to the like medulla um, mm -hmm. and involving like the, it's like the middle cerebellar peduncle as well. Okay, great. And then uh, what's, and then in terms of its relationship with the fourth ventricle and. Um, it looks like it's kind of blocking, uh, the foramen of, um, uh, Lushka. Good. Excellent. Excellent. And then this is the post gathered <laughs> image. So yeah, I, you know, don't say it's not contrast enhancing until I show you the contrast. Oh. In contrast in image, that's fine. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, just tell um, me the what you see here now. Yeah, so it looks like it's a contrast enhancing lesion. Um, that's like at the foramen of uh, Lushka. Yeah, you're exactly, yeah. So you can see here kind of uh, extending onto the foramen of Lushka, good. 
Um, this is just a, kind of another image to burn that in your head when you're thinking about surgical approach. So just uh, but good moving forward. Um, so you have a posterior fossil lesion in a 33 year old. Um, would you order any other additional imaging? Uh, and then, you know, kind of along with that, you know, what is your, what's on your differential? Cause so that will kind of lead your decision-making about what other imaging you could potentially order. Um, it could be because it's coming out from Lushka. It could be a, uh, like cord plexus papilloma. Okay, good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else, anything else you see posterior fossa, fourth ventricle, maybe like, um, a pin you know. moment, but usually oh. that's like the fourth ventricle. Though. Okay. No, that's good though. Okay. A pendomoma. All right. And then I guess if you look, if you, if you think it's a pendomoma, then you could get an M, like a MRI CT and L spine to make sure there's no, no drop mats. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So very good. Um, another, another, so yeah, and MRI CT and L spine is a great thought in, ca in case you're thinking of pendomoma, thinking of drop metastasis. If you know, if it was a child, um, you could also potentially worry about, you know, medulloblastoma, again, thinking about drop meds, getting an MRI, CT, and L spine. So that's excellent. Um, so good thought. Another adjunctive study uh, that was ordered, something else could be on the differentials, hemangioblastoma, right? So, and that's associated with what syndrome? Uh, VHL. VHL, which is found on what chromosome? Uh, chromosome three. Excellent. No, wait, sorry, 17. No, three. 17 three. is NF1, okay? Oh. And you can remember that NF1 is von, Riechen, von Riechenlihausen, which has 17 words. So remember NF1, chromosome 17, the full description of NF1 in terms of the, uh, the eponym is uh, 17 words. So that's how you can remember that. But VHL, exactly, chromosome three. So um, hemangioblastomas are you know notoriously... Uh, very bloody, uh, you know, so another, an adjunction study you can get is an, you know, a diagnostic angiogram, see if there's anything you can embolize. In this case, nothing was able to be embolized, but um, what kind of uh, injection is this? Uh, it's, it's a like vertebral artery injection. Um, right. And what vessel, know. good, good. And what Looks vessel like, is this? Um, it's a pica. Excellent. Very good. And what, what are, what is this, what are these vessels here? So the top vessel, it's PCA, and then the bottom right below, it's SCA. Excellent. So posterior cerebral artery, uh, superior cerebral artery. Um, excellent, excellent. So that was negative. Um, so this is just, we already went over this. So differential diagnosis, like you said, ependymoma, hemangioblastoma, choriplexus papilloma, you know, less likely interventricular meningioma, you know, always in the, in the posterior fossa in general, um, maybe not necessarily in this case, but think, you know, metastasis sh uh, should also pop into your head. And lastly, pallocytic astrocytoma. Any additional testing we discussed. Um, so in this case, um, in terms of surgical approach, um, you know, what is, what's something you would consider in terms of uh, what the uh, approach you would take um, and what's your goal for reflection? Um, can you go back to the imaging real quick, just so I can see? Uh, yeah, one second. Oh, and then the sagittal. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just because it's lowered down by the frame and magnum, then you can just go a left uh, far lateral approach to. Okay. That's, that's completely, that's fair. Um, another option obviously is, you know, the a retro signal yeah. craniotomy, um, is in terms of, uh, access, you know, you would, it, it's not like your typical retro sig that you would use for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, obviously that'd be too high up, but an, you know, an extended retro sig, uh, could certainly, uh, get you down there. Um, and that's what was done. Um, so left retro sigmoid craniotomy was performed. Um, this is just going back a few slides, just this, this re relevant anatomy for a retro sigmoid crani. You know, it's uh, most important, your, you know, your landmarks or your landmarks or your, you know, your transverse sigmoid junction, your stereon, um, you know, measuring from the, uh, 
the external auditory meatus and uh, and using that as a landmark as well uh, when uh, tr trying to measure your transverse sigmoid junction and sending your burr hole um, around the transverse sigmoid junction uh, when 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 turning your crany. Um, and then this is just uh, some relevant anatomy just for typical retro sigs that we do for hemifacial spasm and or trigeminal neuralgia. You know, important just to know the relationship between you know the seventh, uh, the eighth nerve and aica labyrinthine artery um, and the lower cranial nerves. <clears throat> so um, now we'll move on to the pathology section. So great job, Eva. Um, Dr. Voltikin, if you're available. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Here you go. Okay. So um, this was, uh, this is an H&E and shows a moderately a cellular lesion with a fibrillary background and cells with, uh, you know, some of them with mild to moderate atypia. Um, you can see on the right mid middle part of the um, slide, a red elongated carrot-like structure, which is, yeah, go to the middle right up. It's a elongated carrot-like red structure. Oh, here. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. You said keratin. I didn't. I missed that. Yeah. Okay. So that's a Rosenthal fiber. Okay, and it's kind of nice longitudinally cut, and Rosenthal fibers, of course, give you a hint of what this may be if it's uh, located within the tumor. If it's the Rosenthal fibers are outside the tumor, they could just be a reactive change uh, because of compression of tissues. But if you see enough of them within the tumor, next slide, please. It may be part of the, yeah, you can see here more of them on the left this time. Yeah, one, and there are a couple of them up above, exactly. And you can see there in the middle, uh, bill, you know, uh, uh, hyalinized blood vessels, blood vessels with, uh, yeah, exactly. A lot of collagen in the wall, uh, less cells, less smooth muscle cells. So it's kind of a degeneration that happens in low grade tumors. And you can see the fibrillary background and low cellularity. So this is uh, an example of pilocytic astrocytoma which stains with uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein where you appreciate more the pyloid elongated bipolar uh, structure of the neoplastic cell. And the KI67 index is just less than 1%. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, this is a positive gastrocytoma. Um, you know, like, like Dr. Kotikin said, um, a major buzzword for these, especially on the boards, is you know sourcing them with the, you know Rosenthal fibers, like you mentioned. So uh, put that into your memory bank, um, and then obviously that they're GFAP uh, positive, and uh, you know in this case, you know they're who grade one, their K67 is going to be very low. Um, so remember that. So uh, in terms of pyocytic astrocytoma and their history, so. 1931, Harvey Cushing was actually the first to describe this tumor based on the studies of 76 cases of cerebellar astrocytomas that he had done. Uh, and pilocytic, uh, just so you know, it means hair-like and, and is derived from the Latin word for pilus for hair. So um, pilocytic astrocytomas, you know, also known as juvenile, uh, or previously pilocytic astrocytomas, you know, they're low grade, like we mentioned, very low k 67 index. Um, they have a range of imaging uh, appearances, but the majority have, you know, have a large cystic lesion with an enhancing, barely enhancing merle nodule. We didn't really see that in this case, which is why uh, it, was an, it was an unusual radiographic presentation. Um, we didn't see that classic enhancing mural nodule that we typically do. Um, and that's the, that mural nodule, that enhancing mural nodule is what we focus on, especially during uh, resection. Yeah, you know, the large cystic lesion hasn't shown to be ha have any uh, malignant uh, features to it. Uh, but the mural nodule is what we most focus on during surgery intraoperatively. Um, if I can just advance forward. So in general, uh, positive gastrocytomas, um, you know, can typically arise from midline structures. So 60% occur in the cerebellum, 
Um, you know, they can also occur in the optic pathway. Again, this is morally, more commonly associated with NF1, which we briefly touched on, remember, associated with chromosome 17. Uh, and then other uh, less common locations, are, you know, the brain, brain stem, excuse me, uh, ventricles and spinal cord. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the treatment, you know, you know, they're typically slow growing and, and well circumscribed tumors. They have an overall good prognosis following a surgical resection, specifically that mural nodule. And their five and 10 year survival is typically 95%, which is excellent. Um, and surgical resection, if complete, is, you know, like I said, usually curative. So uh, we'll go to the next case. Uh, let's see who we have available. Uh, Vignesh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, sorry. No problem. Okay, so we have case number three here. So this patient's a 30-year-old male, no past medical history, uh, presents to the emergency room after having multiple episodes of left upper extremity twitching. So he had mul uh, multiple of, the, of these events, including three events the last, last 24 hours. So a CT was um, performed. Um, he was actually sent... Um, sent out initially, the, the CT was read as normal. He was brought back to the emergency room on exam. Um, he's awake alert oriented to person um, and is otherwise neurologically intact. So essentially you have a 30 year old male presenting with these multiple uh, episodes of left upper extremity twitching, uh, having multiple events over the past 24 hours, um, otherwise neurologically intact. So um, let's first show, see, uh, talk about the CT scan that was done in the ER. So tell me if you, what you see, if you see anything, um, and then we'll go, go from there. Um, uh, at least here, the CT looks relatively normal, maybe like on the, on the CT on the right hand side. Um, uh, I mean, it, it looks, it looks relatively normal. I can't really see, see much uh, on anything here. Okay. Look at my mouse. Uh, looks like there may be a like a hyper density there adjacent to the faults. So hyper dense would would mean that it, it's you know bright right or it's going to it's going to have the same density as bone right. So this would be sorry hypo hypo, hypo dense sorry right right, yeah. right okay good and now so we get an MRI so tell me what you see on the MRI and um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, it looks like he so has... And tell me what sequence this is. You know, yeah, um, this is a uh, T2 sequence. Looks like there's some uh, T2, like flare hyper intensity uh, adjacent to the flux on the right side. Okay, good. Uh, and what am I What am I pointing to here? What What? Uh, what gyrus is this? That's um, superior, uh, this is superior frontal, right? Right, exactly, okay. And then um, what gyrus is this? Uh, that's going to be um, motor. Right. So this is the or presental gyrus, yeah. right? And then what, what is this? That's the uh, central sulcus. Excellent. Excellent. So then what is this? Uh, Post-central gyrus. Exactly. So perfect. So guys, you know, put that into your head um, in terms of identifying the motor strip that's critical. You know, if, going back to his presentation, we can actually like, you know, it's, we're, we're, he's, he's, it sounds like he's having, he, they just describe these as episodes of left upper extremity twitching. But uh, if you're a neurologist, what are you thinking? Especially uh, with imaging findings, you know, abutting the motor strip. Yeah, I mean, you'd be thinking, you know, with that presentation, something like seizure. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, just kind of nail this into your head, guys, um, in terms of identifying the motor strip, you know, there's, you know, tons of literature on this, this like, you know, Greenberg has a great, um, a great section on this in their first chapter where they talk about, you know, just important landmarks. So like we said, superior frontal gyrus, meaning the precentral gyrus. Another way is, is uh, identifying the, the precentral sulcus, frontal sulcus, it'll, it'll uh, uh, essentially intersect the knee with the precentral sulcus. And right behind the precentral sulcus, you have the motor strip or pre- uh, precentral uh, gyrus. And then again, like uh, Vignesh identified, we, we have a central sulcus in between those and then the post-central gyrus. Um, and then another important uh, important uh, landmark is finding the this 
a hand knob or a mega sign. You know, that, that's often where we find the, the hand motor area. So another important um, important uh, factoid just uh, to remember when looking at any MRI, especially when deciding whether this is in an allocal region or not. So um, this is the the next sequence of images. So Vignesh, if you just describe those briefly, you're doing great. Yeah, it looks like um, uh, it's a contrast. Uh, it's a, uh, a contrasted T1 sequence. Uh, so in the area, it looks like he's got a uh, contrast enhancing lesion, sort of at the center of the flare hyperintensity. There, uh, it's pretty heterogeneous. The the rim is contrast good. enhancing. Uh, yeah. Okay, good, good, excellent. So, um, what would be on your differential? So, like, um, so now we have kind of like a almost like a ring enhancing lesion. Um, so, you know, I, there are a lot of Herosian teachings here. So differentiating um, GBM, abscess, metastasis. Can you just walk us through those? Especially now without Dr. Harris's conference, we, we kind of miss these uh, important factoids. Yeah, I think there are a couple, you know, different things. In the first one is, you know, high-grade glioma, infection, abscess, maybe lymphoma, mm -hmm. um, metastasis. Uh, with metastasis, you would have, like a good amount of edema. Um, right. And, you have the, uh, right. You, have, you can have the, the, the most amount of edema for, uh, for the size of the lesion. So a tiny lesion causes a significant amount of edema, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes with metastasis. Um, good. Move, go ahead. Uh, and I know with regards to the um, with to abscess and hybrid glioma, the different lesions can have different, like the, the rim itself has a different uh, like thickness of contrast enhancement. Yeah, right. So, so right. So the abscess has like a very well-defined uh, like thick border. So remember that for abscess um, and it's kind of in between in terms of the amount of edema it can cause. It's like intermediate between um, between GB, like a glioma and metastasis. So again, we're talking about ring enhancing lesions and differentiating like a glioma, metastasis and abscess. So we said um, glioma can have, you know, very uh, irregular borders. Um, abscess has well-defined uh, borders, right? And then uh, metastasis is, you know, somewhere in between. And then you talked about the edema, which is very good. The, you know, the metastasis can have the most amount of edema for the for the size. So a small metastasis causes a, a significant amount of edema. Uh, and then abscess again is kind of intermediate. And uh, glioma, uh, depending on the size, can can be on the lower end of the spectrum. Obviously, you know, these aren't hard fast rules, but this is like something to think about when looking at this imaging. And then another imaging study you, you want to get, uh, Vignesh, if you're thinking about abscess with MRI is what? Um, you want to see if it restricts on diffusion. Exactly. So if it restricts on diffusion, if that ring restricts on the diffusion, then you're thinking highly likely to be an abscess. All the things that can restrict on diffusion are what? Uh, so I guess like stroke or infarction can restrict on diffusion. Of, of course. Well, but I'm talking more about tumors. Uh, I guess uh, like... Epidermoids, right? Epidermoid can restrict the diffusion and highly metabolic tumors like medulloblastoma can also restrict the diffusion. Um, okay, so good. So we talked about the imaging findings already. Um, briefly talked about the, the differential. So good job with that. So we said glioma, metastasis, abscess, you know, infectious. And then um, we have that down. Would you get any additional uh, workup? Uh, I mean, I guess you could see, you know, you could, you could sort of send an infectious marker, see if any of them are elevated. You could, I guess, if you're worried about metastasis, get a CT test and pelvis, uh, do a metastatic workup. But I think you, either way, we probably need tissue. Good, good, good. Excellent. So another, another adjunctive study, um, those were excellent. We're, uh, you know, MR venogram as well, you know, it's it budding the sinus, um, as we had mentioned earlier. Um, so always important to not only take, you know, what eloquent structures and near, is it nearby? So we already mentioned that it's, um, you know, near, uh, near the motor strip, but also the fact that it's adjacent to the superior sagittal sinus. So an MR venogram was done. And like you said, a CT chest sagittal and pelvis was also performed. So in terms of management, surgical considerations, what would you suggest or, or offer to this patient? Yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, one, you would need like a tissue sample to at least guide treatment. 
um, and uh, it's it's right adjacent to motor, so that's that's going to be the tough part in terms right, of like right. any, any sort so of what, right, right. So what what would you how would you do the cert like in terms of what would you tell your anesthesia team potentially or what other what other instruments would you have available and um, to kind of help you help you with this given the fact that it, it's uh, you know very near eloquent areas of the brain. Yeah, I mean, one, you know, you could, if, if you're, you know, trying to, uh, well, one, you know, you would, you would want like, you know, the Ojeman or, you know, stimulate. Right, perfect, in, good. In right place. Good, excellent. So yeah, having the Ojeman available um, to, to stimulate, to help you identify the motor area, you could potentially do this awake if your anesthesia team um, is willing to offer that. So like, like, you know, like you said, you know, an Ojeman was, was used. They did a frontal parietal craniotomy. They did this in the lateral position. So they had a lesion side up. Okay. So the, the, the right side uh, was up. They had the patients uh, in a lateral position. So the, this uh, l- l- using gravity, you can have the less ha- hemisphere falling away from you. And they also use a lumbar drain um, to help with brain relaxation so that you're not retracting and manipulating, uh, the motor strip. So, um, and then, uh, in this situation, you know, you know there are a few ways you could go about this. Uh, you know, interestingly, they use the transfalcine approach, which is, um, which I'll show you in a, in a few images, if I can just advance forward. Um, this is just like relevant anatomy that we talked about earlier in terms of knowing um, but, you know, along the falks, you're going to have, you know, leg motor. And as you progress hand motor, and then the face, um, uh, as you go out laterally. So in this case, you know, contralateral transfals- transfalcine cross cord corridor was used, which is, uh, eloquently, uh, described in this image. Um, and, you know, this is just another important picture of relevant anatomy. So an, an MR venogram was also done. Like we mentioned earlier, always important to keep in mind important vessels, um, when you're looking at, at any uh, at any tumor adjacent to the sinus, um, and you know in this case you want to this just shows the kind of the dural opening as you flap it over towards the sinus. Um, so now we'll just go to the um, pathology section, Dr. Voltikin. Yeah, so you can see here a portion of brain tissue uh, flanked on both sides by some cellular infiltrates uh, that that seems to be consisting of mostly chronic uh, inflammation, maybe a mixture of acute and chronic inflammation. So this by itself is not specific. Next. So it looks, it doesn't look like a a tumor metastasis or glioma right off the bat. So under high power, you can see that there are uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Yeah, it was closer to your arrow. Yes, on the left, a little bit left anyway. Um, and and uh, this is uh, there's a blood vessel here and um, other mononuclear cells. Uh, so it's a mixed inflammatory picture next, which is in- important because um, when you guys send frozens, sometimes these non-specific uh, answers or responses come from us. We say, okay, brain with focal inflammation, you know, has not really anything to do with what specific diagnosis we could give here. Uh, Here, uh, this is a much more comprehensive picture of an abscess-like cavity in the center, again, flanked by a a layer of fibrous um, capsule-like element, the lighter pink element, yes, and then, of course, more inflammation and uh, and the brain tissue. So this is really nice for uh, an infectious lesion or a brain abscess. Here, you can see the wall uh, on the left lower area, that's the cavity, and then the fibrous capsule, a layer of uh, mixed inflammation, and then on the top right, the pink part, top right, yes, that's the brain, that's the reactive gliotic brain. So you can see here the layers of an abscess in a textbook manner. Okay. Now, it so happens that on the side, there's another piece of tissue, which is not uh, human tissue. This is uh, cystocercosis. 
so essentially all that inflammation, cavity, abscess, etc., was caused by a cystocercosis. In this case, it's a dead parasite and it has been there for a while. It has degenerated. So, uh, and we can't really pick out the layers, etc. in this case, but we see this often in this geography uh, and, uh, you know, it's easy to diagnose once the sample is there. Um, so, neurocystocercosis. Perfect. And here you can see, again, the parasite, uh, the cuticular layer, the wall. Uh, you don't see the hooklets or the organs here because of the, uh, again, the degener degenerated state. You see some calcified areas on the top, those purple areas. Uh, but uh, it's a good example of uh, neurocystocercosis. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Goldie, again. Um, so neurocystocercosis is caused by you know, a CNS infection, as we know, with uh, the pork tapeworm, tinea solium. You know, most endemic in you know, low-income countries, um, most commonly seen in uh, Central and South America, Asia, and Africa. And again, it's a perpetuation of the parasitic disease related to poor sanitation and, and hygiene. Um, in terms of pre clinical presentation, seizures are actually the most common symptom, um, as we saw in our patients uh, in the ER. Um, also, can, uh, headaches, ultramethylitis, hydrocephalus it can also be associated with it. Um, you know, the, like uh, Gultigan, Dr. Gultigan mentioned, you know, the infection which leads to extra intestinal disease usually occurs as a result of eating food or drinking water contaminated by human feces containing the tinea solium egg. So, you know, it's important to remember, it's, uh, it's actually not the ingesting of the pig uh, that contains the larvae that, that uh, infects us um, with neurocystocosis uh, intracranially. It's actually um, having contaminated feces uh, in our food or drinking water with those eggs that have been shed by someone else um, that, that then results in those larval cysts forming. Uh, and then, uh, you know, like we talked about, you know, infection can be both uh, intra and extra ax uh, axial and um, in terms of common locations, you know, obviously in the cerebral hemispheres, uh, the basal cisterns and uh, throughout the ventricular system with the fourth, fourth ventricle being the most frequent location. And in terms of treatment, um, you can include symptomatic therapy. So uh, in this case, in this case, you know, the patient was started on antiepileptics uh, and an injunctive to that, you want to give a, the patient albendazole and proziquantel, which are the two most common antiparasitics most commonly used. So important to remember that also for boards, you know, albendazole, proziquantel for treatment of nurse sarcosis. Um, so we still had another case or two, but we have um, an, an upcoming presentation coming up. So I'll end there. Um, thank you guys for your attention. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. For those who I have not met, my name is Jean-Paul. I'm actually one of the, one of the home sub eyes. Um, so I'll be talking to you today about uh, what I did during my research year, which was how ENA regulates self-renewal properties of primary glioblastoma neurospheres. All right, so just to provide a little bit of a background, uh, ENA, which stands for Enabled Homolog, has been studied in a wide variety of solid tumors, uh, such as breast cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, gastric cancer, for example. But when it comes to glioblastoma, it's actually less well studied with these two uh, publications really being the only primary reports in the literature discussing this protein in uh, the role of uh, GBM tumor biology. So we sought to understand the role of ENA uh, and how it influences glioblastoma tumor behavior. So the proposed mechanism for how this protein actually works is that it acts on the actin filament. And so normally, as the actin filament starts to grow, capping proteins uh, bind to the end and stop its growth. Um, so ENA will then come in and actually bind to the growing end of the actin, actin filament to allow it to continue to grow as it interacts with these scaf uh, scaffolding proteins such as SHIP2 and IRSP53. Um, so this is actually a normal part of physiology. Um, ENA is actually a really important protein for uh, nervous system development in particular. However, in uh, cancer, cancer cells can hijack this pathway, overexpress ENA, and cause continued growth of actin filaments. So when this happens, uh, it actually facilitates metastasis 
of cancer cells. And then I also want to provide a background on what neurospheres are and actually why we use these models in the first place. So neurospheres are essentially uh, clusters of neural stem cells that are characterized by their ability to grow in these tight spherical structures shown on the left side of the screen. Um, so studies actually have used neurospheres and they can extract them from the primary tumors. And perhaps what's the most important characteristic about neurospheres is the fact that once they are implanted into immunocompromised mice, they are able to grow tumors with both neuronal and uh, glial elements. And um, it's been shown as well that tumors that produce uh, extensive amounts of these neural stem cells are actually associated and in independent predictors of a more, uh, a more hazardous phenotype and associated with more rapid tumor progression. And then lastly, uh, it's also been shown that these neural stem cells are highly resistant to chemo and radiotherapy. And so they're thought to be, uh, they're believed to be responsible for tumor relapse uh, following a conventional therapy for a glioblastoma, including surgical resection and temozolomide. So now that the stage is set, I kind of just want to talk about what we actually did on our end. So first we uh, used a tissue microarray and subjected it to immunohistochemistry in order to look at the relative expression of ENA in uh, glioma samples as compared to normal brain. And then in our GBM neurosphere models, we transfected them with ENA specific uh, small interfering RNA to knock down the production of the ENA protein. Then we subjected those neurospheres to uh, a battery of tests, including Western blot, uh, viability assays, neurosphere formation assays, as well as apoptosis assays. So here are the results of our tissue microarray and immunohistochemistry. So if I can direct your attention to the left side of the screen, uh, what you're seeing there is the relative expression of ENA uh, in the patient-derived uh, glioma samples. So what you can see is as compared to normal brain, high-grade glioma, so the grade threes and grade fours, actually had a statistically significantly higher relative expression of ENA. So once we got that result, we wanted to see, okay, can we see the same thing in our GBM neurospheres as in, is there an increase in expression of the functional unit of the protein uh, in our neurosphere models? And what we saw was that was indeed the case. Uh, in 12, 28, and 43, we saw a high expression of ENA uh, relative to NHA, which stands for normal human astrocyte. So taken together, uh, what we kind of derived from this was that ENA is upregulated, not only in high-grade high glioma, but also in our GBM neurosphere models. And this served as a template for the rest of our experiments. So next we wanted to just look at the uh, relative viability of our GBM neurospheres after knocking down the ENA protein. So we transfected these uh, with the siRNA, collected them after seven days, and just used a cell counter machine to look at the relative viability of the control cohort, which was transfected with uh, scramble siRNA and the ENA cohort, which got the ENA specific knockdown. And what we saw from that was that uh, knocking down ENA was actually uh, responsible for significantly reducing the viability in all three of our models, 12, 43, and 28. So we deduced from this that ENA not only is important for uh, cell motility, but it pl plays a role in uh, the viability of these neural stem cells. Uh, next, we want to look at the self-renewal capacity of our GBM neurospheres following ENA knockdown. Uh, so for this, uh, we conducted a neurosphere formation assay where we seeded the cells into a 96 well plate. And then after that, we just counted the amount of neurospheres that were able to form uh, in each well. Um, our graph uh, was pretty convincing in that ENA knockdown significantly reduced the amount of neurospheres that were formed. Um, but I think also the microscopic images were also pretty convincing where you can see that in the control group, uh, the amount of neurospheres that were formed were not only higher in number, but uh, the morphology of them, they were able to achieve those tight uh, uh, spherical structures. Uh, as compared to the ENA knockdown group, uh, not only were they not as confluent, uh, but the, uh, the neurospheres themselves were not able to form uh, the, the morphology that is remnant of, of these GBM neurospheres. So from this, we, we kind of just concluded that uh, now ENA also plays a role in uh, neurosphere formation and the self-renewal capacity and ability of these neurospheres to, uh, to propagate. 
Lastly, uh, we conducted apoptosis assays, uh, including a relative caspase 37 activity assay, as well as flow cytometry with anexin and propidium iodide staining. And so what we saw from this was that ENA knockdown actually uh, significantly increased the activity of these apoptotic enzymes, caspase 3 and caspase 7 in all of our models. And then further, uh, we conducted flow cytometry uh, to look at the relative proportion of GBM neurospheres that were in uh, either early or late apoptosis as compared to the control neurospheres. And what we found was that there was a significantly higher proportion of these neurospheres that were driven towards apoptosis in the ENA knockdown group as compared to the control cells. Uh, so this was a very interesting result that for us, uh, we took to, to mean that uh, knocking down ENA was actually able to drive these cells towards apoptosis. And so, you know, when, when conducting these kinds of experiments, you know, we try to ask ourselves, why does this matter in the first place? The in vitro data looks great, but uh, does this mean that, is this something that could eventually translate to better patient care down the road? And I, and I don't think we have the answer right now. I think it's really dependent on its ability to translate. But what we, what we kind of hope for the future is that if it is translatable, can we really see a reduction in the amount of stem cells that are left behind following conventional treatment? And of course, this would be uh, an adjuvant therapy um, in addition to surgical resection and temozolomide, but with the momentum behind gene editing, uh, you know, it leads to the question, if something like this, if you can identify a target, silence it, uh, can it truly uh, help uh, patient care? Can it truly help a glioblastoma relapse and, and provide better treatment options in the future? So in conclusion, uh, we deduce that ENA is required for self-renewal of GBM neurospheres and that knocking ENA down actually was able to decrease viability of these neurospheres by driving them towards apoptosis. Uh, and in the future, and what is being uh, still conducted right now, is we want to understand the signaling pathways that are regulated by ENA and how it actually contributes to our findings. And then of course, move this in vitro model in vivo in an intracranial in vivo GBM mouse model. So I just wanna very quickly uh, thank the INDS and the NIH uh, for supporting me, uh, my PIs, the lab. And I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Raghav uh, for his letter of support, which helped me get into the program. Thank you. Hey, JP, uh, that's fantastic work. Congrats, congratulations. I just had one question. So, so it seemed like even in these GBM uh, cell lines, which are incredibly well characterized, that the ENA expression on those Westerns were kind of variable. Um, and so, and this relates to translatability, you know, how, how, do you think they would look in, you know, selected GBM samples in terms of expression if we, if, you know, if we did an assay with like our, our library? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, in terms of, you know, expression, it, it seemed to be kind of actually antibody specific. So when I was running these Westerns, um, like dependent on the company, I would sometimes get better results. So I think it was really about optimizing it. And once it was optimized, we started to get consistent results in terms of expression. Um, one thing that we also found that was interesting was we expected at least a baseline expression of ENA in the normal human astrocytes, and we actually didn't see that. Uh, so your question is, is, is excellent. Uh, I think it just requires a lot of uh, optimization. And then also it probably will be dependent on the tumor behavior with more aggressive tumors showing a higher expression of ENA. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, Greg, if you're just a question for you uh, to follow up on Dr. Levy's point. So you mentioned that ENA is involved in, uh, in normal brain development. Uh, have you looked at uh, this model using the knockdown method to see how that affects brain development and, a, uh, and would you anticipate that being an issue from the standpoint of tolerating this type of treatment in both an adult or pediatric brain? Yeah, I was actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Raghav, for that question. I was actually thinking about that yesterday. Um, it, it, it likely would be uh, a method of treatment that for children uh, would be an issue. Um, it's, you know, it's very much involved in neuronal migration. 
Um, so in, in the growing and developing uh, CNS, it's pro it probably would lead to deleterious effects. Uh, so this likely, if if we could, if this was an uh, uh, efficacious target, I imagine it would probably be, probably be useful only for adults. We just KJP, great. Oh, sorry, Dr. Ryan. No, that's all right. It just it just it would be a fascinating way also to look at at uh, the malformations of cortical development uh, that are very common in children uh, and the dysplasias of the brain that we see presenting as epilepsy and other sorts of uh, uh, birth-related uh, uh, disorders. It would just be fascinating to see how this molecule uh, plays a role in that sort of pathology. So Absolutely. very exciting yeah. work. I Thank agree. you. Thank you, Dr. Argo. Uh, JP, excellent talk. This is Dan. Um, really, really enjoyed that. Um, I, I was sort of thinking about that same, a similar question, but I guess a simple experiment you could do is have an, add another control group so where you knock down ENA and, for example, normal human astrocytes, you know, the baseline level is low, but just a sort of kind of a quick and dirty test to see the impact of the virus. Like, does, is the issue that it kills all cells or is it focused specifically on neurospheres? Um, I, sorry, are you saying does ENA knockdown kill all cells? Is that, is that what you're asking? Well, it seems like it, it reduces the viability of neurospheres pretty convincingly, mm -hmm. but I guess my, my question would be, is it specific to neurospheres? Like if you were to knock down, you know, normal human astrocytes, would that also decrease their viability? You know what I mean? Like, I, I just think it'd be an interesting control group to add. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. And actually, yeah, I, I don't actually think we conducted uh, that with like a, a cohort or a, or a group of neural, normal human astrocytes. But that would be actually really useful because we were just, I guess, looking at the expression. But I would want to know uh, for normal brain, you know, what, what kind of behavior it causes. Does it cause a decrease in viability, self-renewal, pretty much all the other things that we looked at. So thank you. There's actually a database online that you can use that you can look and see whether if, if you're looking at a particular protein or gene, it affects um, likelihood of survival and survival length in GBM patients. So you might want to just look at that. Um, I mean, I think all these are great experiments, but that'll take you like five seconds to look online and give you some sense of the data in a sample population. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. McCray. So hi, everyone. My name is Wyatt David, and I'm a visiting sub -I from Yale. Uh, first off, I would just like to say thank you both for allowing me to speak at Grand Rounds as well as having me on service. I've really enjoyed my time at Miami so far and have learned a lot, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, JP and Dr. Jim Sheedy, those were some great talks, hopefully ones that I can uh, follow up strongly during my talk today on clinical outcomes research in neurosurgery. So for my three years in medical school, my team and I have been investigating clinical outcomes in neurosurgery. A number of reasons led us down this path, with one of the principal factors being exorbitant healthcare expenditures in the United States. As of 2020, per capita, the United States spends roughly twice as much on healthcare costs per year as the average of other countries, spending roughly $11,000 per year per person, while the average is roughly $6,000. The second close closest country is Switzerland, which spends roughly 40% less than the United States. Not only do we spend more than other countries, but this has also been growing as of late. Um, in the 1970s, as one can see, the United States was spending roughly as much as other Western nations on healthcare, but in recent years, especially starting in the early 1900s and 2000s, this rate has increased rapidly. So we, have a, we, have, we spend more than other countries and this rate has been increasing. And along with that, the quality of healthcare in the United States is also lower than that of many comparable countries. There are many different metrics used to measure healthcare quality. One of the most common is the Healthcare Quality and Access, or HAQ, index rating, which is a measure that uses age standardized, risk standardized mortality rates for 32 causes of death that timely and effective healthcare could potentially prevent. And as you can see from the graph, the United States lags behind many countries in quality of healthcare, um, roughly six points below the average. So there's an obvious issue in the healthcare system that must be addressed, which makes the way for clinical outcomes research. Clinical outcomes research seeks to understand the end results of particular healthcare practices and interventions. And there are a number of hospital quality metrics used to measure these clinical outcomes. Some of the more commonly used quality metrics can be found on the screen, including length of stay, 30-day unplanned readmissions, patient satisfaction, patient reported outcomes, preventable complications, and non-routine discharge. 
by understanding the teleology of such metrics and poor clinical outcomes in these areas, we can optimize these, these metrics in order to decrease healthcare resource utilization and improve patient quality of care. One of the most highly studied proxies for clinical outcomes is hospital length of stay. Extended hospital length of stay has been linked to decreased patient satisfaction and increased rates of post-operative complication, 30-day unplanned readmissions, and mortality. Not only is extended length of stay linked to worse patient outcomes, but it also leads to significantly higher costs. An extra day on the floor in the hospital typically costs around $4,000 a day, while in the ICU, it costs roughly $12,000. It's thus unsurprising that a small number of patients are responsible for a large chunk of healthcare costs, with the top 10% of patients being responsible for 70% of annual spending. It's thus imperative to understand the patient and hospital level factors predisposing to extended length of stay so as to mitigate such factors and improve patient outcomes while simultaneously decreasing healthcare expenditures. Especially in the era of COVID, decreasing hospital length of stays has become imperative. One way that many providers have utilized this length of stay concept is by grouping the top 75% of patients together and labeling the cohort as extended length of stay. We adopted this convention with our papers, um, starting with length of stay following spine procedures. So one of the first papers that we wrote was regarding length of stay was titled Associated Risk Factors for Extended Length of Stay Following Anterior Cervical Discectomy Infusion for Cervical Spondylotic Myelopathy. In this paper, we demonstrated that extended length of stay, which is defined as greater than three days um, was significantly associated with higher costs. So you see it's roughly twice as expensive for patients that have longer stays. And you also have high rates of non-routine discharge dispositions with roughly five times greater rate for patients with extended length of stay compared to patients with normal length of stay. We also go on to demonstrate that there are a number of patient level factors, both preoperatively and postoperatively, that are significantly independently associated with this extended length of stay. Factors such as age, female sex, income quartile, race, healthcare coverage, and postoperative complications are all associated independently with extended length of stay and multivariate regression analysis. Further, we can stratify more specifically the complications. Um, you can see things such as um, hematomas, UTI. Um, pneumonias, things that patients also commonly get in the hospital are significantly associated with extended length of stay. Um, along with increased costs and adverse discharge disposition within the spine realm, we also looked at ex extended length of stay and unplanned hospital readmission in our paper titled Patient Risk Factors Associated with 30 and 90 Day Readmission After Cervical Discectomy and Nationwide Readmission Database Study. So in, the, in this paper, we demonstrated that patients that experienced, un experienced unplanned readmission, both within 30 days and 31 to 90 days within, within um, discharge date, had much longer hospital stays than patients who did not experience readmission. So in the 30-day cohort, the average length of stay was roughly 10 days, while in the 91, 31 to 90-day readmission cohort, the average length of stay was roughly eight, compared to a length of stay of three days in patients that were not readmitted. From the spine realm, we then moved on to the vascular realm. We once again looked at length of stay and aneurysms on our paper titled Predictors of Extended Length of Stay Following Treatment of Unruptured Adult Cerebral Aneurysms, a study of the NIS or nation, National Inpatient Sample. Similar to spine, we showed that patients with extended length of stay, which in the vascular realm is a bit longer, and the 75th percentile was defined as, seven, as five days, um, had significantly higher total costs of admission, roughly $26,000 more than patients with normal length of stays. And similarly, they had higher rates of non-routine discharge dispositions with rates roughly seven times higher of going to skilled nursing facilities, acute rehab and such. Similarly to the spine realm, we looked at, we looked at, um, at factors that were independently associated with this, with this extended length of stay, both pre and post-operatively. So as one can see, age, female sex, race, insurance status and various comorbidities, post-operative complications, and the method of intervention were all significantly associated with extended length of stay. Um, once again, we looked specifically at the complications, things like UTIs, DVTs, respiratory complications from staying in bed too long are all associated with um, longer hospital stays following, following um, these, unruptured bath, these unruptured aneurysms. From vascular, we then went on to Chiari length of stay. First, we started with adults with, 
with Chiari and demonstrated factors associated with extended length of stay on our paper titled risk factors for attending extended length of stay after suboccipital decompression for adult Chiari 1 malformation. Um, one can see that extended length of stay here, it's four days for the Chiari cohort, led to higher total cost of admission, roughly $10,000 more, as well as higher rates of non-routine discharge like we've seen in the vascular and spine realms with roughly four times as many extended length of stay patients going to non-routine discharge dispositions as opposed to normal length of stay patients. And then once again, we see a number of factors that were associated with extended length of stay. It's the same factors that we've seen in the vascular and the spine realms, just to see that it kind of transitions um, amongst various realms of neurosurgery. So once again, age, race, preoperative comorbidities, and number of postoperative complications and type of complications were all associated with longer hospital stays. And, this, and once again, the complications that we've seen in other realms are applicable to the Chiari realm with, with UTIs, cardiac complications, DVTs, all contributing um, and being associated with this extended length of stay. Um, then from adult patients with Chiari, we then went on to Pediatric patients with Chiari in our paper titled Preoperative Headaches and Obstructive Hydro Predict Extended Length of Stay Following Suboccipital Decompression for Chiari Malformation in, in Kids. Um, so once again, you can see that patients with extended length of stays had roughly $10,000 higher total cost than patients with normal length of stays. And similarly, discharge dispositions, a higher rate of patients with normal length of stays were discharged to normal or to routine discharge dispositions, as opposed to patients with extended length of stays. And the big takeaway that we found to be associated with extended length of stay for pediatric patients with Chiari malformation was actually obstructive hydrocephalus was the major preoperative factor, as opposed to a lot of the a lot of the other demographic fa factors that we saw in our other studies. So to kind of recap, our studies have demonstrated that there are a number of patient and hospital level factors that are associated with extended length of stay following neurosurgical procedures, and that extended length of stay is associated with clinical outcome, worsened clinical outcomes. Thus, the mitigation of prolonged hospital stays is one potential avenue for both improving patient quality of care and decreasing unnecessary healthcare expenditures. Such a strategy would implement both preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative protocols so as to improve healing after surgery and facilitate smooth discharge home. So this is where the ERAS protocol comes in. Dr. Patel will speak about this in the coming hour, so I won't, well, I won't speak on it, but essentially it combines pre and post-surgery checklists to improve on hospital stays. And one particular reason I wanted to give this talk is because of the emphasis on ERAS at Miami, um, Dr. Wang's work in spine, a lot of the other residents and faculty members, there's a major emphasis on it here, which is, I think, one of the major reasons we see such, such good clinical outcomes and short hospital stays, especially in COVID times when um, procedures are getting canceled at UMH because of beds um, is one, one time that's particularly emphasized. Um, so just to give a brief, a brief view of some of the other work that we've done, we talked about length of stay, but we've also done, talked about readmission and the negative impact readmission has on, on patients. So we talked about readmission following um, cervical discectomies, readmissions following post lumbar fusions, um, surgery for spine metastasis, and BP shunts. And then similar to length of stay and readmissions, we have also talked about factors associated with non-routine discharge and the negative impact it has. So we talked about non-routine discharge in ACDFs in patients with adult spine deformity corrections, um, some other papers on, on spine, and then spine surgery for spinal tumors. So this is kind of some of the work that we've done with clinical outcomes in neurosurgery the past years, and, and hopefully some avenues that can be advanced to, to improve outcomes in neurosurgery, which Dr. Patel will speak on. And with that, I would like to thank my team and my lab. Um, Dr. Elson Medise is a fourth year resident at Yale and Dr. Ku, he's a second year at Yale or two of the residents that I've worked a lot with. And then Dr. Matuk, Dr. DeLuna, Dr. Gunnell and Dr. Colley are some of the attendings that have really helped us with that work. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you and ask for any questions. Um, Wyatt, thanks for the brief segue into ERAS. Um, so um, I'm named Tesh Patel. I'm, a, I'm from Jersey originally. I did my residency in neurosurgery at Rutgers, and um, I'm here as one of Dr. Komatar and Dr. Ivan's fellows for the year. I'm pretty excited to be here, and uh, you know, I've been here about two months now and seen some pretty awesome stuff, um, specifically um, you know, regarding the way you guys handle post-op recovery, et cetera. And it's very impressive how fast you guys are able to turn around patients and um, you know, get them back on their feet. 
Um, it's something that I haven't seen in any other institution. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about enhanced recovery after surgery and uh, why I touched on this a little bit um, specifically for um, uh, for spine surgery. And, um, you know, there's a lot of literature that's been coming out for spine surgery, specifically from Dr. Wang's um, team here, which has been very impressive. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we learned for cranial surgery um, and how that sort of um, affects our patients. So first thing, you know, I think what we need to talk about first is just going to be uh, the concept of the physi physiologic response to injury. You know, patients are often asleep, obviously, during surgery, unless it's an awake case. Um, but the body still reacts to trauma, um, which is surgery. I mean, we're inflicting trauma by making an incision, cutting through layers. Um, a cascade of events is therefore triggered, which leads to a whole bunch of cytokines and cytoregulatory hormones. Um, muscle and fat breakdown ensues. Um, this is an effort to produce energy. Um, acute phase proteins also are produced, which can trigger response to injury modes in various organ systems, you know, in the pulmonary system, cardiac, renal, GI tract. And of course, this can lead to pulmonary inflammation, um, uh, injury, atelectasis, cardiac stress, renal injury. Um, and you can see uh, how patients' labs can change post-op, along with the gastric stress, along with the surge of the pituitary adrenal axis. So, you know, we can use the analogy of a marathon, the finish line, of course, being recovery. Um, standard expected recovery times for the ideal patient um, can greatly lengthen due to various factors. It could span for multi-organ or system baseline gun control diseases, um, and therefore careful review of existing uh, medical regimens or medication regimens for patients is sort of critical in to bring the patient as close to ideal as possible, sort of reducing this red line here um, and, and sort of uh, ensuring a more standardized recovery process for our patients and therefore making um, um, back to baseline uh, as uh, efficient as possible. Of course, the goal of ERAS is to preoperatively identify patients which are fit for a procedure, for the, for the procedure in mind, along with this expected recovery. Um, ERAS protocols typically define three phases of care uh, in which a series of small interventions can produce big results. Um, these sort of sections or, or phases are typically preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative, kind of what Wyatt showed on that uh, actually similar slide with the gears um, on his presentation. Um, so ERS protocols have been developed using evidence-based and a multidisciplinary approach. I mean, you have multi-team buy-in, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, of course, our surgical team, our nursing team, et cetera. And over the last decade, um, their use has expanded from general surgery um, all the way to a wide, wide variety of specialties, especially uh, certain subspecialties. For neurosurgery, our spine colleagues, I said earlier, um, took on ERAS uh, sort of early. Um, this visual protocol is from Dr. Wang's uh, recent paper, um, and taking any one of these interventions individually, uh, you know, if you look at this, you'd see, all right, um, you'd look at preoperative education and counseling or er early oral nutrition or early mobilization and in hospital physical therapy. These seem like small things and, you know, you can easily brush them off, like, oh, what's the difference getting physical therapy uh, immediately in the morning versus waiting a couple hours. So, you know, the patient's more in the mood for it. Um, it's again, each of these little factors may, you know, may not seem like a lot, but it's their combined effect. That's the real factor. Even if each intervention, let's say reduces the complication risk by a fractional percentage. Uh, if you add them all up, I mean, you can see there was a potential for a significant percentage points to be decreased from overall complication risk. And one key component here is to, is the top and bottom bars. Uh, you can see across the top, um, again, from this figure from Dr. Wang's paper, preoperative education and counseling, and then across the bottom, uh, audit compliance and account outcomes. Um, you know, we should not take for granted the power of this sort of continued patient counseling and reinforcement. And you can see it when you talk to patients and sort of reinforce the expected outcomes, the expected trajectory of care, you know, emphasizing that, you know, you may not see a change day to day. You should, re you know, the patient should look at themselves week to week or the family should assess things week to week because small things may go up and down, but the overall trajectory of care is forward. Uh, and, you know, of course, on the other side of it is auditing ourselves, our patients, our team, and seeing how we can make things better. Um, so some of the early ERAS uh, approaches were actually labeled more so as um, fast track um, back in the early 2000s and late 90s. It wasn't necessarily called ERAS. It was called more fast track protocols. And essentially, they challenged more traditional models of care. You know, some of we're used to uh, for other areas of neurosurgery. 
Um, and of course, you know, they looked at a, a large, a fairly large combined study of a bunch of smaller studies and for the general surgery population. And they noted that there was a significant reduction. I mean, the less than half in overall post-op hospitalization using these fast track or ERAS protocols. So this is a big deal. And it does translate over to spine surgery as well. Um, for spine surgery, again, this is from our own institution uh, regarding one to three level <clears throat> lumbar fusion surgery. Um, I mean, there's some very strong results here. I mean, length of stay, Zofran use, and opiate use, specifically Percocet, um, drop across the board. Uh, and these are you know, significant reductions. And at the same time, distance ambulated with physical therapy increased significantly, uh, all pointing towards improvements uh, and faster sort of a return to baseline for our patients. So, you know, how can we identify which areas are, are key for improvement? So this diagram sort of goes over some small but important steps that can sum to a much larger effect. Um, these are sort of, uh, this actually was taken from an early general surgery paper uh, that goes over just factors that can contribute to delayed or accelerated recovery after elective operations. And I actually put a red asterisk next to, um, you know, just simple things. And these are things that you can accomplish anywhere, uh, especially when resources are limited. Even if each of these factors, such as anxiety and fear, hypothermia, hypoxemia, sleep disturbance, even if each of these factors can reduce, let's say, complication risk by a quarter percent, which is fractional, 11 of them combined can mean a 3% risk reduction uh, if obviously everything went perfectly. So there is potential for a major improvement here with a combined effect of these little things. Again, it's the little things. Uh, of course, you know, the ERAS mindset is great to have, but patient selection is probably the most important thing. Uh, we assess each patient's level of function using the KPS, of course. Uh, generally, a KPS greater than 70, uh, careful preoperative clearance, correspondence with referring physicians, primary care physicians, and documentation of all these things so everyone can follow these things as they assess the patient um, are, are extremely meaningful and can play a pivotal role. And of course, you know, um, we sometimes do look at a role for other interventions such as pre-op embolization or advanced vascular imaging for large lesions or lesions near some eloquent uh, vascular structures. So here's a typical, um, you know, timeline of uh, this is something that I'm used to from my, from my own training of how, you know, sort of things came in. And there's there's variation, of obviously, amongst attendings um, and amongst providers. And I'm, I'm sure in my career and all of our careers, we're going to have our own preferences and stuff. But, you know, a, a standard sort of uh, approach to an office, with, let's say, in, a, in, in, a, in a, an ABC neurosurgery institution, uh, you know, you have your initial encounter in the office, you will assess the patient needs surgery. So you'll schedule surgery for about two to six weeks later or so. In the meantime, medical cardiac clearance will be obtained from the patient's uh, primary care provider, cardiologist, whatever it may be, and imaging may be obtained from a local radiology office near where the patient lives. And these images somehow trickle in and their CDs will make it over to you, hopefully, along with the um, corresponding positions um, you hope the reports come through. Uh, 6 a.m. happens on the day of surgery, the patient arrives, you know, sort of rushed in. Um, the patient's anxious, of course, right? They probably haven't slept all night. And now they're, um, you know, seeing uh, a series of residents, uh, attendings, nursing staff getting IVs, anesthesia, getting consent, the surgical team getting consent. I mean, it's just a, it's a lot of, lot of things going on, a lot of anxiety for the patient, which obviously um, isn't great, especially when, you know, the patient um, has a lot on their mind. And then, of course, post-op, you know, pain control will be standardized, of course, to grow with PT. These are all goals we have. But, you know, there may be variation in the type of pain medication we use. Depending on who the resident is on call, how busy the resident is, or the, who the physician is on call, they may prescribe a, let's just say, let's just give them Percocet. We'll give them two of morphine, and that'll get them through the night. And, you know, these, these little things that can lead to bigger issues. DVT prophylaxis is another thing. Where I trained, you know, there was huge variation when we'd start sub-Q heparin from attending to attending. And I kept a little note in my phone to try to remind myself, but it's something that should be standardized, unless, of course, there's a risk or, or a real reason to hold off. Uh, and then, of course, length of stay, you know, I would see typically after a cranium, you know, four to five days, um, sometimes three days. Uh, in an urgent, semi-urgent sort of setting, you know, ER visit, surgery happens zero to three days later, you get rapid clearance really fast. You may order a bunch of images, some of which you don't even need. Then surgery happens. And again, of course, you have a non-standardized approach post-op. So how can we fix this? Some small things. From an office at the standpoint, try to schedule surgery as fast as possible, um, especially for brain tumors. A patient with a brain tumor is not going to wait. If you can't see them and treat them, um, they're going to go to somebody else. It's that simple, especially in, a, in an area with a lot of competition. 
Um, and also a realistic discussion with the patient, you know, ex to explain to them what the goals are, you know, what the train of thought is. And patients are a lot more receptive than we think, especially when we can show them some radiology. Rapid correspondence with referring docs and primary care providers. I mean, we should be reaching out to them, not waiting for them to reach out to us. This can help not only have a clear lines of communication, but also can improve uh, future referrals. You know, these, these other providers may be like, well, you know, you know um, they, could, they could simply be like, you know, Dr. David over here, it was very, you know, very great. He could communicate us very nicely. So we're going to send our next patient to him. Um, also, something we do, uh, you know, I've noticed here is admitting the patients the night before. It sort of allows for a smoother pre-op. You can get all the images, IV lines, et cetera, and the patient get a good night of sleep, hopefully. Obviously, there'll still be anxiety, but there's less travel in the morning, less chaos. And then, of course, the post-op stuff, a multidisciplinary buy-in, standardizing medications, prioritizing out of bed, physical therapy, et cetera. Um, these all make big differences and you can improve length of stay. You can go from four to five days to two to three days or even one to three days. In an urgent setting, obviously, you know, there are some, some differences here from an office setting and, you know, in an urgent setting, obviously the patient's already in the ER, they're going to become inpatient. You got to work with the ER to find a reasonable scheduling slot um, and just sort of try to get it done as fast as possible. Rapid correspondence with inpatient physicians, of course, just like you would do with an outpatient, but it's even more imp important inpatient because these are our, our colleagues. These are from our in own institution. And of course, this is a small but subtle thing is avoiding unnecessary tests and images. When a patient's already inpatient, you're like, well, I can just get a CTA too, or I can go and get this. Um, you know, they're here anyway. If the study is not going to add value, it's just adding time and anxiety to the patient. And it just clears a more nebulous picture and just more data, which again, sounds great, but it can cloud the picture. And then of course, a well thought out surgical plan and backup plans. And then finally, the same sort of post-op approach. Um, so let's go back to tuning up for a marathon, some patient expectations and discussion, things you should talk about with the patient, realistic plan, trajectory of care, uh, potential outcomes, all possible scenarios for, for you know, uh, possible major risks. Blood thinners, pain control, glucose control, and incentive spirometry are all critical. There are obviously a bunch of other factors too, but these are four factors that I always think about. Uh, blood thinners are an obvious risk. Um, the key is sort of balancing surgical timing and, and holding the treatment. Um, so you got to work closely with the primary care providers, a cardiologist, neurologist, whoever are involved. And then of course, standardized review of medications multiple times, especially for anticoagulation. Every time you talk to the patient, you got to reinforce, you know, hold the aspirin or the Plavix, whatever they're on and make sure they don't show up on the day of surgery or the night before surgery and say, I just took my Eloquist this morning, um, which, you know, puts us all in a pickle, uh, pain control. Um, honestly, you know, this is, uh, this is an active area of research, especially with the opiate crisis, you know, match group studies have shown that pre-op education can massively decrease use of post-op opiates. Again, it's amazing the power of discussion. Um, you know, clear discussion of, of the incision, expected size of the incision, expected areas of pain, timeline of pain, and any restrictions can save a lot of phone calls and a lot of use of opiates. Um, and symptoms that should or should not cause alarm should also be reiterated to the patient. So they know not just when not to call you, but also when to call you. Um, it's more of a higher yield. Glucose control, you know, we hear about in the general surgery world, and we've all learned about this um, in medical school, that it's important to maintain, you know, uh, normal uh, sort of avoiding hyperglycemia. Um, actually, you know, some of the data that's been out has not necessarily shown a, a risk for brain tumor specifically, but it's more so for steroids. You know, steroids, of course, can trigger hyperglycemia, and it's critical for diabetics. So I have a standardized protocol. And then, of course, uh, you know, let's not discount the, the power of incentive spirometry and in preventing um, sort of dead space. And, you know, small studies have shown for cranial surgery that there are improvements in, uh, in, in lung function, especially FEV1, uh, and, you know, decreasing atelectasis and reducing CO2 retention. So those are all some of the preoperative factors that are important. Let's talk about some operative considerations, and I'm going to go through about five different areas here um, and nuance. And these are all approaches you know, that we're, we're, we're aware of. And, you know, choosing the optimal approach sometimes requires thinking beyond the standard textbook choice. And a utilization of one or multiple approaches can have significant value. All these approaches are common to the neurosurgical armamentarium. Um, however, you know, we can sort of go through some nuances that are relevant for ERAS specifically. Again, it's the little things. So some fundamentals first before we go into those five. We use neuronavigation for essentially all cases. Neuromonitoring is used obviously judiciously specifically sensories, motors, direct stem. And then we, you know, carefully th think about the expected degree of resection that, that we have to keep in mind. So uh, sort of four, four points here. For benign superficial lesions, the goal is gross total resection. For benign deep lesions, conservative approaches is preferred. 
Obviously, don't go chasing things that you don't need to chase um, just for a better, a prettier post-op picture. It's just not worth the risk, of course. For malignant superficial lesions, gross total is the, is the, is the goal, but you got to respect anatomy and function. That includes mapping things out. Um, for malignant deep lesions, biopsy, and we consider radiation and or laser-induced thermal therapy, um, and sometimes even tubular approaches to debulk. So those are the fundamentals. Now let's talk about those five areas. So for endoscopic endonasal um, cases, you know, where I trained three pin fixation was pretty much standard for all pituitaries. Um, and, you know, uh, occasionally some attendees would not. And, you know, so the use of three pin fixation for cranial surgery is sometimes necessary. But axiom for transsonoidal surgery is more than, efficient, more than sufficient in a large majority of cases. Uh, pinning itself, it seems benign, right? You just, put a, just put the patient pins or asleep already, anesthesia is controlling blood pressure. But, um, you know, we've all heard patients complaining about post-op uh, pin site pain. And, um, you know, it doesn't come without risk. You can get a fracture, you can get a hematoma, scalp hematoma, you can get a frontal sinus fracture, all kinds of things can happen. Um, so, you know, it's also um, important during the exposure for these endoscopic and nasal uh, approaches to avoid sort of disrupting existing tissue planes unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, excessive turbinate mobilization or takedowns, or preemptive nasal septal flaps, excessive posterior septal takedowns all come with the risk for complications, especially something benign, mucosal stripping, um, you know, taking the mucosa off the, the, the bony septum or the exposing the, um, the cellar space. You know, it seems benign, but it actually causes a lot of pain. I talked to Dr. Sarji about this. It's a, it's a significant complaint for patients and can even lead to um, cartilaginous necrosis of the nose, and uh, this can lead to a significant nasal deformity requires revision surgery. We don't see this because this just goes to the ENT side. Um, so identifying major vessels, of course, is standard. We should also be aware of CSF pockets, and it's important for juniors to take note. Look at the sagittal image and look at where the arachnoid planes in front and behind the gland sort of dip down. Uh, you can get, easily get a leak if you're not careful. Um, and then, of course, we use these spyway tubes here. We use silastic tubes in New Jersey, but these spyway tubes are even cooler. I have a short little video of this to show you guys what these look like. They're like these mesh tubes that can expand and fill the nasal, nasal cavity, which I think, of course, you've all seen. Um, but they're kind of nice because they protect the mucosa as you go in and out, um, and they can make the world a difference. So uh, for cranial sort of work, um, you know, the workhorse craniotomies, which we all learned about a residency, the OZ, terional, subtemporal, et cetera. Um, they were created, obviously, before all the advanced navigation abilities that we have today were widely available. And of course, there's been sort of um, different versions of these created as well. And the standard learning for all neurosurgeons. Um, you know, but neuronavigation has sort of allowed us to take these same approaches and sort of tailor them a little bit more to avoid, you know, things that can cause morbidity, specifically the frontal sinus. Uh, the orbit, the periorbital, mastoid air cells, and sort of venous structures. Um, the pseudo exception is when there's a high likelihood that a degree of brain retraction is necessary, um, in which case, you know, got to take care to ensure that a maximal cranial opening is, is, is performed to avoid, um, you know, pulling too hard and, and disrupting a vein. Because um, this can lead to delayed venous injury, which you might see three days later or two days later where the patient's confused and altered. Uh, so this is most relevant for frontal uh, area meningiomas that are deep. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, transcortical approach may be better serve the patient. Uh, tubular approaches, you know, tubular retractors um, allow for reach of deep seated targets. Um, they're thought of as being a fiber track splitting, but more than likely there is a degree of cortical or subcortical injury. Um, however, in contrast to traditional paddle retractors, which we've all seen, uh, force is applied circumferentially and retains a cone of work for these tubular retractors. It's not the solution for everything um, as trajectory change is sometimes a challenge, but it allows for a much smaller craniotomy and a nice working quarter, um, which can help protect uh, surrounding brain structures. Um, and of course, a smaller incision. Uh, here's an example of a lesion, you know, that was done entirely th through a tube. I mean, uh, it's very impressive that this, this giant thing was taken out uh, through a tubular approach. And um, you know, this patient was discharged home post-op day one, which is, again is extremely impressive. Uh, for, you know, deep lesions that are malignant um, or near critical structures, you know, we can always consider the value of biopsy and laser ablation. This is sort of a, um, a working algorithm that I've been using in my head, and it sort of comes from Dr. Komatar's sort of teaching. And, you know, you have a deep seated lesion. Is it greater than three centimeters or is there a significant edema? Yes. Well, then probably needs a surgical resection, uh, open surgical resection. 
if it's smaller than three centimeters or there's not significant edema, you have to ask yourself, do you need tissue to diagnose? If you don't, well, probably radiation oncology is, is, is probably the, the folks to give us the best uh, set of uh, hands there to help. If you do need a tissue diagnosis, you consider a stereotype needle biopsy, which again, we use the Rosa robot here, which is great. It just reduces error to a submillimeter um, uh, level with high degree of precision and accuracy. Um, and then the role for lid, of course, if there's preoperative sus uh, suspicion of an infield recurrence or radiation change, of course, um, you know, we can consider the, uh, the role for, for lit. Um, and as I said, you know, you can do both of these in sequence. You can, you make a single two millimeter incision and two millimeter burr hole, drop in your needle biopsy, and then just sort of swap out for a laser catheter, go to the MRI suite, perform your ablation. You can see on this right um, hand MRI, this is a deep seated uh, suspected MET, um, which we were able to ablate essentially completely. You can see the pre-op images above and the post-op images below. Uh, and discharge a patient um, post-op day one, um, which is kind of nice. It can go home and you have a small incision with absorbable sutures. Um, again, uh, lit and biopsy together, they can accomplish both diagnosis and treatment. Transcortical approaches. You know, sometimes, as I said, a tubular approach is not feasible and therefore a transcortical approach is needed. To minimize cortical injury and disruption, we choose the shortest distance through the least eloquent cortical tissue. That sounds easy, but it's a lot more difficult. Um, key moves here that contribute to ear loss are avoiding excessive bipolar use uh, once about a centimeter deep, uh, noting peel banks and circle boundaries, and um, of course, avoid taking vessels in general, especially veins, and that, that should be a rule. Venous anatomy is often less predictable than arterial. Um, this means that what may seem like an insignificant vein may lead to a delayed venous infarct and, and much bigger issues. And then, of course, uh, you know, one of the last offer of consideration is to do a surgery awake or asleep. You know, awake craniotomy is a phrase that usually triggers a, the attention of everyone, uh, at least in my program, you know, an awake craniotomy was a, was a production. It required a, a lot of planning and, you know, discussions with anesthesia, neuropsych, neuromonitoring, neurosnursing staff. And this was even before you considered standard factors such as patient tolerance, positioning, and stimulation plans and testing. Here, it seems like, you know, uh, you guys have this down to a science, which is very impressive. Uh, and I'm, I'm suspect that, you know, I suspect that it's strictly just from volume alone. Of course, the more volume you do, the team gets more used to it. Uh, it leads to more efficiency. Um, so we essentially, you know, consider an awake approach for any primary brain tumor um, in or near high end real estate. And of course, upon finishing the bone work, we let anesthesia know to wake the patient up so that by the time doors open, we can proceed to testing immediately and reduce the time. Um, it allows for a much faster anesthesia recovery, better anatomical functional outcomes and shorter hospital stays. Of course, it can't be used in everyone. You gotta think about patient tolerance, et cetera. Um, and it, again, I just want to uh, emphasize how important it is to demystify the process for team members. I mean, especially our nursing staff and even our OR tech staff, you know, awake sounds very complex. And of course it is, it's, it's cranial surgery, but we can demystify it. It's, it's got a lot of similar elements to a standard craniotomy. Uh, this is uh, just for, for, for giggles here. We have uh, one of Dr. Komatar's patients from last year, the, the famous Cranioki video. <laughs> You guys are hearing the audio. Of course, on the other side of the drape, you have uh, I think it's evident that phones are operating. Um, so again, you know, we can actually do some pretty cool testing and, uh, you know, such for these awake cases. Um, so let's go back to, you know, operative planning in terms of positioning, you know, stress on the patient's neck and shoulders during positioning. Again, these seem like small things, but, uh, you know, good use of bumps and positioning devices to maintain as neutral of a body position as possible, meaning twerking the head, et cetera, to rest of, uh, rest of, the, rest of the body can, um, you know, over several hours can lead to a lot of muscle spasms. So it's critical to try to maintain as neutral of a position as possible. We try to always approach things supine, but of course you got to sometimes go prone. But if you do, then normal anatomic alignment is critical. Um, surgeon access and position are also important. So you got to balance this. Um, and staples can be your best friend, especially for, for big chunks of hair, as you can see in this image here. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, keeping shaved to a minimal. And they can easily remove these staples, which is nice. Uh, other things for incisional planning and soft tissue work, 
hidden incisions are always ideal. Uh, we minimize hair shaves to almost none. Uh, the temporalis muscle is also often encountered in the trajectory of frontal and temporal approaches. We avoid making cuts in a temporalis, even small cuts. Um, they seem insig insignificant, but it can lead to major discomfort. Just imagine how often we engage our temporalis when we eat and chew and talk. Uh, even a small temporalis injury will be felt, and that can make a patient feel a lot sicker than they are, especially if they can't eat properly. Um, and then finally, of course, the frontalis branch of the facial nerve should be, uh, should be a point to note on exposures, especially for trans temporalis exposures. Uh, bone work. Avoiding the frontal sinus we talked about earlier. Uh, as mentioned, um, uh, each bit of bone work should deliver a real advantage for surgery. Each move should really count. We try to always, always use a unilateral approach, particularly for bone work. Uh, the skin incision may extend across midline, but the bone work should avoid it. Even for large anterior skull-based tumors, a unilateral approach can accomplish an equivalent, if not better outcome sometimes. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that there's, a, there's no role for a bilateral approach. It sometimes is necessary. Uh, but sometimes a transcortical route may be a good option to keep the cranial work smaller. And this, this case on the left is something we just did, uh, you know, just two days ago uh, for this massive tumor. And we did this through entirely through a left frontal approach. And we sort of um, marked out the frontal sinus and catered our cranium to avoid getting into it. Uh, and then the one on the right is a similar case, which we did entirely through a unilateral approach. Uh, other operative considerations, corridor creation and pathology handling. Um, avoid bipolar work deep in the surgical bed, especially beyond a centimeter deep. Uh, for senior residents, uh, it's good to, to slow down and slowly develop an understanding of the sub -PO technique and its value for protecting sulcal vessels living in the sulcal space. Of course, sometimes you do need to bipolar deep, um, and that's, and you know, all of our skull based colleagues will tell you that it's sometimes critical for that. And that's, of course, when you have a clear view of what you're bipolaring. The deeper you go, of course, the more and more important things get that are concentrated into a tighter space. So, just, again, just be very careful. Um, I do want to emphasize this sort of sub peel technique uh, and just understanding it. You know, it can make a world of difference when you're doing dissections and protecting vessels in nearby um, uh, sulcal banks. Uh, other things, duroplasty enclosure. We try to obtain as tight of a dural closure as possible. Sometimes only a scaffold may be created. Regardless, we utilize a multilayer approach with dehydrated amniotic membrane, which is DAM or amnion. And then, of course, we use bovine collagen and duragen. Um, Amnion has been shown in, in our published years with, with uh, you know, Dan um, to provide lower rates of CSF leaks and pseudomeningocele's, and this means less of a chance for wound breakdown and or infection. Um, shown as an example of the Amnion and sort of what it looks like uh, on, the, on the right here. It looks like on a recurrent case or a redo case. You can see it looks almost like native Dura, which is kind of nice, uh, nice seal. Uh, Duraplast enclosure for closure specifically for barb suture it works really nicely. Um, and also good for to telehealth era. Uh, you know, patients don't necessarily have to follow up in person. They can be in the comfort of their own home. Post-op things, uh, make anesthesia aware when bone reconstruction is complete. Um, limit opiate use. So obviously the whole team must be on board, not just certain people. This way, you know, uh, if you have a, a, any, any one person on call at 2 a.m. that has somebody in pain, they're mindful of the fact that we got to avoid opiates if we can. And of course, emphasize to the patient a post-op care plan, especially during morning rounds. You know, uh, when you see them in the morning after day of surgery, like, you know, you got to clear out goals for them. Here's your MRI, here's what we did. And MRIs are nicely obtained here at this, this institution, which is kind of amazing. You can show them their post-op MRI and then tell them, look, you're gonna have breakfast, make you out of bed, at least to a chair, if not walking. And it sort of gives them goals and they look forward to these goals and you can tell them, look, things go well, we can go home later on today. And uh, it's amazing what these little things can do. Um, again, speaking of imaging, you know, have radiology work with you to have a priority imaging protocol and understanding the value of how important this is for discharge. Um, collages or logos, as we call them, they're a great tool for patient rounds, especially correspondence with referring providers. Um, I mean, these are these images are very clear cut as to what was accomplished, and uh, you know, everyone can sort of understand what was done here. Uh, standardization of medications. Anti-epileptics should have clear indications, of course, and endpoints. Steroids, which have a lot of variation across the country, but you know, here for supertentorial, infratentorial, and uh, cases, depending on eloquency, um, we have differing regimens depending on a, either a one or two week taper. This sort of chart on the right shows that. And then, of course, endpoints. For benign lesions, we go to off. For malignant lesions, we end them at two milligrams BID and then let the oncology team help us out. For elderly patient diabetics, we start at 4Q6, not 10Q6. Uh, and then finally, for antibiotics, anticoagulation, pain control, as we've talked about having clear end and start points and indications. Um, this we talked about, sort of getting them out of bed for breakfast, you know, physical therapy right after breakfast if we can, and 
reminding those patients that are expected to go home the day after surgery that they will be discharged in the afternoon and sort of getting that in their mindset. It gives them a goal to work towards. Obviously, we're never going to push anyone in the hospital, but um, sort of uh, getting them in that mindset of recovery can make a, make a world of difference. A follow-up, you know, we're doing both telehealth and in-person visits. Um, uh, the telehealth is nice because, you know, it sort of does allow the patient to visit from the comfort of their own home, especially for patients who are, who are traveling to see us. Um, and uh, we can use our Dr. Komitar's golden ticket, which is something uh, as part of his intake form that has all the referring doctors, could be anyone, primary care, cardiologist, dentist, anyone who the patient feels is necessary in their, in their circle of care, we will correspond with them no matter where they are. And, um, you know, including sending them the, the, the logos and the images um, in-person visits, of course, within two weeks. And then we obviously work with our colleagues to have uh, appointments around the same time, saving the patient trips. Um, so the air asked for cranial surgery nuance that we've talked about can be applied to a novel protocol. So this is our discharge post-op day zero model, which is kind of impressive. Um, just want to give a special thanks to um, Dr. Barry and Dr. Morell for these figures and data. Um, actually, you know, uh, Alexis was able to give me this yesterday and uh, seems like um, uh, Katie had, and, and I think Evan had put this together. It's pretty impressive, this data that they've collected. Um, for certain cranial cases, including smaller convexity lesions, We've implemented the sort of same day discharge system. We're able to do this safely with a multi-team member approach. We've streamlined our pre-op, intra-op, and post-op steps, all aimed at getting our patients back to normal lives as efficiently as possible. Um, the night before admission is key. It's a key step. It lets us tackle all of our pre-op tasks in the same place and allows the patient to have uh, to not worry about the travel, registration, intravenous lines, and such in the morning of surgery. Again, they have enough to worry about as it is. Um, and post-op, we time imaging to be several hours after surgery, during which time we optimize the patient. Uh, we limit opiate use, uh, encourage mobility and diet, and of course, once imaging is reviewed and we meet medical clearance, we can discharge the patient home uh, confidently. And we've looked at our results for 72 of our post-op day zero case in the last 12 months. Um, this is a small subset of all the tumors we've done. Uh, and sort of with this approach, you know, we've noted a 5.5% readmission rate, which is uh, impressive in sense of being fairly low for this. Um, and, uh, you know, readmissions were all of, of all the readmissions, they were usually for smaller indications or just for, uh, or, or for, uh, for admissions were for constipation or discomfort or non, non neurosurgical issues. And with that, um, I am done. I will take questions. I just want to give a shout out to, of course, Dr. Komatar and Dr. Ivan for being awesome mentors. Uh, my two co-fellows, Dom and Cater, who I'm just very lucky to have, um, Evan, of course, Lexus, Greg, Big, Eva, Adham, um, the rest of the squad here at UMH. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great time here. I'm looking forward to the rest of this year.